Okay, good. good morning, everyone, and can I welcome you to the 10th meeting of 2019 of the Social Security Committee? Can I remind everyone uh, present to turn off mobile phones and other devices to silent mode so they don't disrupt the meeting? Uh, no apologies have been received, so hopefully we will get towards a full house in, in, in short order. Not all MSPs are here. And we move to agenda item one, which is decision to take an item in private. The committee is asked to agree mm -hmm. that item four, consideration of evidence heard during the meeting, uh, is taken in private. Is the committee agreed to that? Yep. Thank you very much. We now move to agenda item two. Now, agenda item two uh, is in relation to benefit automation. And can I refer members to paper one, the note by the clerk and the letter from Inverclyde Council. Um, members also have a short SPICE paper, and I thank SPICE for the preparation of that paper. Uh, the Inverclyde letter uh, draws the committee's attention to a barrier to the council's aim of maximising uptake of free school meals and the school clothing grant. In March 2018, the committee held an evidence session on benefit automation and maximising uptake. Following that session, the committee wrote to all local authorities, COSLA and the Minister for Social Security. The issue raised has now, now by Inverclyde Council was highlighted, in, but in other local authority responses, albeit in more general terms. For clarity and for the public interest that there may be in this matter, I want to spend a short time setting out a context to this matter. Uh, now, I want to quote briefly from the Inverclyde Council letter, which says the Council considers the inability to reuse Council tax reduction data received from the DWP to identify families eligible for free school meals or clothing grants represents a barrier to the maximisation of the uptake of these benefits and has also raised the matter with COSLA, who have undertaken to take up the matter with the DWP. Inverclyde Council is committed to reducing child poverty and, see, and sees the reuse of DWP data as one step in achieving this aim, so would welcome your assistance. And that was a letter to myself in my capacity as convener of this committee. Now, the Inverclyde letter then helpfully summarises its perspective on the legal positions of Inverclyde Council and the DWP, and I thank them for that. I have also mentioned the briefing paper prepared by SPICE, and I want to take some, some of that information and put it on the public record this morning. So in relation to that briefing, social security information sharing. Information sharing is governed by GDPR, but legislation can allow information to be shared for particular purposes under the 2012 Welfare Reform Act. Um, and these are welfare services, council tax and housing benefit. Welfare services include services that provide accommodation, support, assistance, advice or counselling to individuals with particular needs and for these purposes. The explanatory notes of that Act refer to using information to assess whether someone has to pay for residential care and, and this is important, the information may also be used for decisions on whether to provide assistance under localised schemes such as help with council tax. I apologise to members for the length of this explanation, but the explanatory notes therefore go on and say examples of further services covered are the provision of disability facilities grant, blue badge parking permits, discretionary housing payments or assistance to families with multiple disadvantages. I would therefore make two points before seeking, seeking comments from committee members. Firstly, and most importantly, it would appear that the difference of interpretation in relation to the 2012 Act, UK Act between the DWP and Inverclyde Council appears to have led to the denial of data usage, which would deliver, by automation potentially, the school clothing grant and free school meals to families in Inverclyde and perhaps right across Scotland. I would suggest that automation would provide assistance to families with multiple disadvantages. Uh, that would be staggering if the UK government seek to deny the use of data in such a way, and I'm sure they would not want to do that, certainly not intentionally, in order to help children and families in need to, in support of assistance. I would therefore ask that we write, as a matter of some urgency, to the UK Secretary of State for Work and Pensions to speak, speed, seek speedy clarification in the hope that this will direct the DWP to permit the use of this information. However, if the clarification does not enable the use of this data, that the UK government prioritises taking whatever steps are required to amend the 2012 Act 
or relevant regulations in order to enable the automation of entitlement to families who would qualify for free school meals and school clothing grant. And I know there's a lot in that, members, but when a local authority writes to us with a very substantive issue in relation to getting to money, money to those most in need, I think we have to look at this in, in a meaningful way. So I've made a suggestion there, but before we move to agreeing to that suggestion, I would welcome any comments from members at this stage. Uh, Mark Griffin. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I would agree with the, the steps that, that you've outlined. Um, the one thing that I would note from the letter from Inverclyde is that clearly there's a difference in legal position between the Council and the DWP. And in fact, if Inverclyde decided to accept um, the legal advice that's been provided to it by, uh, I imagine, um, its own um, legal experts, that it's hard to see who would challenge the use of the data in that way. And that, um, actually, if, if Council's own legal advice is that they, they can do it to reduce poverty in their communities, then um, I guess I would ask for clarification from, from in Inverclyde whether they are actually going ahead and, and doing that. that that's helpful. Uh, Deputy Convener? Yes, I, um, I agree with um, the comments that Mark Griffin um, has made. It's just put on the record that I think i um, very grateful to Inverclyde Council to join this to the committee's attention because the committee for some time has been really interested in the idea of income maximisation and automation of um, benefits and just draw for the purposes of the record um, the attention to the fact that there are very important principles in the Social Security Act which we just passed and I think that should be drawn to the attention of the DWP that we have principles in that Act which we'd like to abide by um, and never have been an example of a local authority who, who wants to maximise the income and make it easy and it's a proven it's proven to work for many local authorities. Glasgow being the obvious example seems to be the lead in it so with that um, I'm grateful to Inverclyde for drawing it to our attention and we should take it forward. Thank you, Paul. And Jeremy Balfour? Um, I'm happy with the direction you're going. I mean, I think picking up Mark Griffin's point, this does seem to be a legal issue or a, a legal definition issue around this. And so I think it would be interesting to ask the Secretary of State what legal advice DWP have taken and what advice they are relying on. As we all know, if you get three lawyers into a room, you get five bits of different legal advice. So I do think that there is clearly a difference of legal view on this. And I think it would be interesting just to explore a wee bit further what that's happened. Um, I know you want to do this within a, a certain um, way, but I, I do think it would also be asking what, what, uh, what's happened in other parts of the United Kingdom. So have this issue been raised by English authorities with them, Welsh authorities? Um, because clearly it would be interesting to get, you know, I, I can't believe in the Clyde are the only people that have hit this. So it would be interesting to know, have they had this concerns raised from English local authorities and from Welsh um, local authorities? And if so, how have they got round that? And can we get round that? Is it purely a legal issue or is it a policy issue? I think it's a key issue for me, Ryan Rich. I, in terms of, with Mr Allen in a second, um, in in terms of the suggestion you make, Mr Balfour, I think that's very reasonable. But what I would want is clarity that we because we'll talk about circumventing legal issues in a moment, we'll move to the next stage of our discussions. But what ask of the UK government is not to necessarily circumvent legal issues, it's to remedy any deficiencies there may be in the 2012 Act. So rather than have three lawyers in a room sort something out, or argue something out, it would be much more beneficial if we just got clarity to the 2012 Act, which meant we weren't paying lots of lawyers to argue how many angels are dancing on the head of a pin, but absolutely agree we should ask the questions that, that, that you're asking there, Mr Balfour, Alistair Allen. You said everything I was going to say, but better. Thank you. Uh, Alison Johnson. Yeah, um, thank you, Convener. I agree with the um, proposed suggestion and... Um, as the Deputy Convener has said, this is an issue that this committee has long had an interest in. Um, the Deputy Convener hosted an event with Glasgow City Council, uh, I think it was last year, and we, we learned of, of what they were doing. I mean, I think it's important that I'd like to think there's a resolution to this issue, um, because 
given that parties unanimously supported the, the actions in the Child Poverty Act, it's really important that that is the case. Um, I think it would also be important going forward that local authorities have an opportunity to share their activities with one another and to understand what the differences are. I think, that, I think that's, that's very helpful and that we're going to maybe look at suggestions in terms of COSLA and other local authorities in a moment. That's very helpful, Michelle Ballantyne. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the key word for me in all this was the word assumption. So, you know, that assumption that the Act only provided for the three elements of information sharing. Um, and it is a legal thing, and it's the lawyers who've obviously made that, that advice. So I think we should just go back to the UK government and ask, you know, the question, look, this is what we're trying to do here. That assumption, is that absolutely rigid? You know, on what basic legal basis is that? assumption rigid um, and you know can we not have a bit of flexibility in this so I uh, uh, Keith Brown before we move to a final decision yeah, just um, I think a couple of weeks ago at the committee in relation to some of the housing issues that we faced I made the point that um, <clears throat> we keep on looking in lots of these areas at making men solutions you know circumventing this or finding a workaround for that and I I just repeat the point I made then, which I think is we have to look at this at its root. I think there's two different philosophies going on here. One is about income maximisation, which I think has been the case in Scotland and parts of the UK. I think the UK government, I'm not saying it's opposed to that, but it hasn't built that into its legislation, which is why it throws up these, these anomalies. And really, if you were to sort of come back out from this and look at it afresh, what we're trying to do is quite a fundamental thing, which is making sure that people most in need get all the benefits that they're entitled to in as seamless a way as possible. And this is not that. This is not working. Um, now, it may be that we can get clarification from the UK government in relation to this, but I'm sure we're going to trip ourselves up over some other anomaly that comes up as well. And the best thing to do is, is to try and look at it from the other end, which is somebody absolutely struggling um, to feed their kids, clothe their kids, uh, get the council tax reduction they're entitled to and all the other social security benefits. And if you look at it from that point of view, they should have to do as little as possible in order to get that. And the people that are trying to provide those benefits shouldn't be tripping up over each other and trying to achieve that end. It's maybe a kind of forlorn hope, but I, I do think a much more holistic view of the thing has to be taken to make it as easy as possible for people to get the benefits they're entitled to. But I'm happy enough to go along with the suggestions made by, by the convener. I think we do actually have pretty much unanimous agreement in relation to take this forward in relation to the UK government, but just for the purpose of the record, are we agreed on the course of action as outlined? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd also like to draw members' attention from our briefing that the WP has worked with the Department of Education in England and Wales to create an automated eligibility checker to allow individuals and local authorities to check entitlement to free school meals. The Welsh Government pays the Department of Education uh, for use of their eligibility checking service. The eligibility for free school meals is set by the Scottish Parliament and regulations. The eligibility for school clothing grant is set by local authority policy. It is a Scottish policy choice to link eligibility to reserve benefits, a very reasonable one, I suspect, and to set an income threshold for eligibility for those on universal credit. I would therefore suggest that we also contact the Scottish Government, given its ambitions to tackle child poverty and to promote income maximisation. We should also draw their attention, in my view, to the alternative model that exists in Wales. Although personally, I'm not convinced either Scotland or Wales should be paying for the privilege to access data, which is clearly in all of our interests and in the public interest. I suggest we ask whether the Scottish Government is aware of this specific issue and whether it will make representations to the UK Government to seek to resolve this matter also. We should all rec also request, in my view, that the Scottish Government updates our committee on the use of reserve benefit entitlements to access devolved services and how it is working with the UK Government and Department of Work and Pensions to resolve any issues such as the one Inverclyde have drawn to our attention. I think that might be a, a reasonable way to proceed in relation to the Scottish Government. Uh, so I would open that for any comments or, uh, um, from, from members at this point. Jeremy Balfour. Yeah, I mean, I think, the, the, again, I think, um, as Michelle Valentine pointed out in the previous letter, the word is assumption here. And I think it would be interesting, again, just to ask the Scottish Government, as we're going to ask, hopefully, Cosler and Ducos, do they accept this assumption? Because, again, I think, uh, you know, it'd be interesting when, when we do the letter to Cosler, have other 
local authorities taking this assumption on board, or are they taking a different legal assumption? So clearly the principal solicitor from Inverclyde has taken a view on this, and that is what he advised councillors. I suppose the question for me is, has that assumption, does the Scottish Government agree with that assumption, or do they take a different view on it? Um, and then move on to the causal letter in due course. But I think I would like to know if the Scottish Government think this is an assumption is correct, or is the assumption wrong? I am, ab I mean, <coughs> what is it is Marshall and Clark's in terms of what letter would write to the Scottish Government? I absolutely agree with that, but I think I would say for the record again that what I wouldn't want is a lengthy debate about what lawyers interpret the 2012 Act by assumption one way or by assumption another way, or if you get a third lawyer involved, assumption... I mean, I think, I think, I think we should... A, a third, a third we so that, that, just, that, can I just finish what I'm saying and I'll let you back in? So we should absolutely ask what the Scottish Government's view is of the assumption that the DWP make. And for those watching this, that's uh, contained within p the letter that Inverclyde Council sent us in relation to their interpretation of the DWP position, but I absolutely agree with you. I'm merely making the point for clarity for clerks who have to draft this letter that I want the focus to be on a solution and an outcome rather than a legal debate. But I do agree with you, Mr. Balfour. I said I would let you back in. <coughs> I'm obliged. I mean, I think the point is that this is not trying to circumvent the system. This is um, an interpreting the system. Now, I could interpret certain laws in certain ways, and I'm completely wrong. And that's just the way it is. It's not a if we're wrong, you know, if I drive through a red light, I've broken law, even however I want to interpret that. So I don't think I'm trying to in any way say we need to try to get around the system. But if 31 other local authorities have assumed a different model and are doing something differently, Inverclyde simply might be wrong. I'm not saying we are, we aren't. But I think that's the key issue for me is if everybody else is doing this, then I think Inverclyde maybe just need to look at the legal advice they've got. You may very well be right, and I think that's helpful, uh, Deputy Convener. Well, <clears throat> very often, um, if you ask different lawyers the same question, you'll get a different answer. There's, there's nothing new there. So what the DWP are saying is that the, for the purposes of you re reusing the data, it does not appear to include that. I think we all know that with the application of the Data Protection Act, in my experience so far, has been completely overcautious. And don't think there's uh, lots of us have got concerns that this is not that was not the primary purpose of the data and now we're seeing some of the other effects and I would say the DWP have been completely overcautious. In Reclite have got a different opinion where they their opinion is saying that reuse, they're saying reuse is compatible with the original purpose for which the DWP provided the data. So it's up to Inverclyde if they want to proceed on the basis of their legal advice and it's up to anyone else if they want to challenge that. So um, in relation to the point about um, going forward, what are, the, what are the solutions? Well, certainly, if there is any dubiety about use of da that data for the purposes of clothing grants, I suppose our, my position would be, yes, we should write to the DWP and ask them to reconsider whether that should be redrafted for that purpose, but other local authorities may still feel confident that, the, that their inter legal interpretation is correct. As a last resort, I do agree that we should ask the Scottish Government to, get, to have a look at the Welsh model as a last resort, because ultimately we have we have been consistent in the position which we've taken both in the Child Poverty Act, which Alison Johnson refers to, and the Social Security Act, that the principles that we would want to abide by is to encourage the, the use of data for the specific purposes of allowing people to get benefits for which they were entitled to in the first place and not beyond that scope. And within that scope, it seems to me that both the UK Data Protection Act should allow for that and local authorities should feel confident to use it. We shouldn't need to, shouldn't need to pay for that advice, but in the short term, at least until we can maybe take, well, the social security system is set up in Scotland, I presume that that might interpretation might change because we were told the data but until such times as that's the case uh, then I think we have to have last, last resort. Michelle Ballantyne. Very quick one um, I mean I think the reality here is is you're just writing to us the Scottish government what their opinion is on, on this position in terms of data sharing. I, I would just take one issue I'm not sure you can just use data without the permission of the person who's given you the data in the first place. So 
when you said it's up to Inverclyde what they do with the data once they've got it. I'm, I'm not quite sure legally that is correct. Sorry, no, that's what Inverclyde have, have stated. They wouldn't be writing opinion. to us if, if they thought they could just go off and use it regardless when they've been told specifically that their opinion of the person who shared the data with them in the first place well, they couldn't. Said. So, I mean, they're writing to, to, to seek clarification no, over that. Not because so. seeing as a clar no, Inverclyde is saying that reuse of data that they've already been given permission to have of that person can be reused for the purposes of giving them the benefits that she's already entitled to is the opinion which they have. Their legal opinion is that they can. But you made the comment that... You know, it's up to them what they want to do with data yes, once they've got it. Okay. No, 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 sorry, no, no, no. It's up, no, 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 that's not, that's not, that interpretation of my comment. No, my is it's up to Inverclyde how they wish to proceed with their legal advice. Ah, right, okay, misunderstood you then, Not the data, I'm also tempted to say, would all the lawyers in the room please raise their hands now in relation to this discussion? Okay, Jeremy, thank you. Um, I, I don't think we can take that discussion particularly any further, but it does illuminate the fact um, that there's a lack of clarity and certainty that we have to get established. And if that involves amending the 2012 Act, so be it. If it doesn't, and we can move quickly, even better. But in relation to the how I outlined we should approach the Scottish Government, do we have agreement on that? I think to be honest, I think the Deputy Queen has asked a really interesting question. Uh, and that is who owns the data. And if I am right, the new Scottish agency takes control of that data as of April next year. Yep. Mm -hmm. So would that then change? I think it's a question just, I mean, it's quite an interesting question generally, but in this specific issue as well, is come April next year, mm -hmm. when the agency holds that, would that make the agency then the people that, the data controller, rather than DWP? And I think that's just a generally, I find that quite an interesting question generally, but that may well be a different issue that we then face to me. So that, that may not be the situation, but it's reasonable to ask, no, yeah, it may not be. It's reasonable yeah. to ask yeah. that when data migrates yeah. into a new Scottish social security yeah. system, what lessons, what lessons it can learn in relation to using that data effectively to passport and automate benefits. And that might be the way to ask that question rather than... I think that's a more kind of focused way of asking it. I think we've got agreement anyway, but Mr Brown, do you want to come in and add something? And I'm not going to seek to change, just to say that I think the point the deputy community makes is quite an important one, which is, in a way, we're asked, almost being asked to be legal arbiters or to ask somebody else to be legal arbiters when I think it is the case that councils are, if not autonomous, they have their own mandate, they've got their own ability to take their own decisions, their own legal advice. If they think there's uncertainty, they can get QC's opinion. And I'd rather see councils proceeding till apprehended on this kind of thing rather than constantly checked. But um, maybe the greater good is to get the clarity which you're, you're seeking convened by writing to the people that you've suggested and I'll go along with that. Thanks, Mr Brown. That, that's almost like a very, very helpful segue into the final aspect of this that we have to look at before we move to the next session. And, and that's in... Sorry, Michelle. It's worth noting that actually it was Claire Addison's letter to the council asking about it that generated this conversation. Yeah. So I don't think it's that Inverclyde have just come running to us as such to say, I, I, could yeah, we be I, I think, I'll check yeah. you know, I, I think I said at the start that the committee had done previous work and yeah. that's also in the, in the mm -hmm. Spice Papers. I think that's actually on, on the record. Mm -hmm. um, but a uh, fair play to Inverclyde for following this through tenaciously to, to try and deliver for families and in, in, in their area. Now, uh, I don't have it in front of them, but Glasgow had helpfully provided some information. Now, I apologise if I misrepresent how Glasgow have sought to enable some of this, but I understand that Glasgow believe if you're in receipt of council tax reduction, then they use that as passporting you through to accessing the school clothing grant. And then the way they then seek to approach individuals allows them to automate some of these benefits. So there may be other ways where we can give meaningful help and assistance to this. So I think it would be reasonable to write to Glasgow just asking them for an update on how they seek to maximise uh, free school meals entitlement and school clothing entitlement despite restrictions and constraints that may be placed on them in relation to DWP or, or GDPR. Would that be a reasonable thing to do? And just for brevity, could we also, given that COSLA has been approached by Inverclyde, could we, all, could we also write to COSLA asking them for an update on their perspective in relation to this, this matter? Yep. Yeah. Um, I, think we're, I think we're there now. I know we're taking a bit of time over that, but ultimately, 
irrespective of the conversations we've just had this morning, all of us around this table just want to make sure those most in need get the benefits and entitlements that they, they, they should have, they should have as speedily as possible. And as long as we all stay focused on that, we can make sure this committee can uh, hopefully drive some change to make sure that happens. So is there any additional comments before we move on to the next agenda item? Of course you can. It's not, uh, I'm happy enough for that, but you mentioned about the council tax reduction, the way that's used. Am I right in thinking that no council tax reduction applies in England or in Wales? Uh, well, I'm going to repeat that same question uh, also because I, I don't I, I don't have information on that. I think you're right, mm -hmm. but uh, let's let, let's get an update for the next time we, we, we can speak instead of this. Okay. Um, uh, Thanks, members, for their patience. Can also thank um, Spice for their, their assistance in preparing for uh, this morning's meeting for Inverclyde for raising this important matter uh, with, with the committee. Um, we now should we suspend? suspend? Yeah. We, we will now shortly be moving to agenda item three. Uh, three? Yes. yes. Agenda, agenda item three. But can we suspend briefly just to allow uh, witnesses to take their seats? Thank you. Suspend. Okay, welcome back. We're now moved to agenda item three, which is social security support for housing. And this is the third evidence session for the committee's inquiry into social security support for housing. And the focus this week's session is the social sector landlords and local authorities. And can I welcome uh, our witnesses, Jeremy Hoare, Policy Lead, Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, Julie Malloy, Chief Executive Scottish Borders Housing Association, Paula Doherty, Benefits and Welfare Team Leader of Fries and Galloway Council, John Mills, Head of Housing Services, Fife Council, Gail Ward, Housing Policy Officer, Highland Council. Thank you all five of you for coming along and uh, for waiting patiently till we got to this, this agenda item. We are moving straight to questions, but just before we do that, we thought it was important to have so many witnesses here so that we could get a, a, a very representative view of what's happening across Scotland, because it'll be different in different parts of the country. That does put some constraints on five people answering the one question so uh, we don't want to constrain your ability to put things on the record but if other people are effectively saying what you're going to say anyway it might be quite helpful if you could maybe just confirm that and we can move on and it allows you to come back in to raise additional points just in terms of the management for this session and, and i thank you for that uh, we'll move uh, straight to questions now uh alistair allen Thank you, Convener. Um, on the point that, the, that you've just made there, Convener, uh, about the, the variety of people uh, on the panel here, one of the things that, that interests me is the, the variety from local authority to local authority of the balance between different housing types that are available to people. Um, looking at the figures here, for instance, for the private rented sector, Dundee City Council has 26% um, of its uh, housing in the private rented sector. Shetland has 6%. My own local authority in Helen and Near is at 9%, although I'm fairly sure most of those are actually holiday homes. Um, what, what difference to the, the picture that we are talking about, about, um, about housing and, and benefits, does, does, the, does these very varied pictures make um, when it comes to different parts of the country? John Mills. Yeah, I think it's a, a good point. I mean, I think uh, every uh, housing authority and, and their uh, partnering housing associations work in different local housing contexts. And that's important in terms of access to housing. And if you're looking at prevention of homelessness, we're looking for as wide a range of housing options which are affordable and sustainable um, as possible. So if, if there is a huge diversion or a large diversion in terms of access to social rented um, owner occupation private rented housing 
then that does affect the local housing strategy in terms of its aims, but also practical um, difficulties for people trying to access housing in their locality to keep kids at school or, or to maintain their registration at a GP. So it is quite significant, but that also offers opportunities uh, for different areas. So I don't know if that answers that particular point, but it is different across Scotland. Okay. Any other comments on that, Paula Dorsey? I think within Dumfries and Galloway, the information that I hold is the housing benefit records, and the housing benefit records, one in five of the people on housing benefit are in the private rented sector. You know information really around what else private sector accommodate rentals out there, unless you look at the landlord registration list. Um, so is one in five, is that across the whole region, or is that just the people that are on benefit? Okay, any other comments before we come back to Alice or Jeremy Hewer? Um Thank you, Chair. I would say that a concern is the high rate of turnover that you get in the private rented sector, um, which is at least double, I think, what the social rented sector is, so it would be about 16% or more. Um, you've got, a, um, and if you've got that high rate of turnover, and I think one of your pre uh, witnesses at a previous um, session was pointing out that private sector landlords may be more reluctant to let to um, folk who are on benefits, you're, if you like, you're getting a, a diminishing stock there. And our concern is that if, if there's a diminishing stock, there's a greater con um, pressure on the social rented sector to try and provide housing. I think that's very helpful to, to help, worrying, but very helpful to put on the record. Alice or Alan, do you want to come? Well, thank you. That, that leads me, I suppose, into the next area I was interested in asking your, your views on, which is, you, you mentioned there, potentially reluctance uh, on the part of, of some landlords uh, to let the people um, who may find themselves uh, in the situation of claiming universal credit. Um, what evidence do we have from, from the panel about uh, the situation of, of rent arrears uh, more generally and whether that picture is changing? A key word. Yeah, I think from a Highland perspective, um, we, we've been a live universal credit site for five years now. And the general trend is towards rent arrears increasing significantly um, as a consequence. Just adding on to the, to the last question, we've undertaken um, some consultation through crisis with the private rented sector and 43% of the respondents to that have said that um, they would be willing to rent people on benefits, but only if there are financial assurances in place that would help them to secure those tenancies and put support in place. I think from um, the rentaries perspective overall, um, I think there's been some unintended consequences of policy changes over the last five years around the benefit system. And um, we are... <laughs> The average rent arrear that we're seeing in comparison to people on legacy benefits is two, three, four times significantly higher, um, which is having that overall impact on homelessness, rent arrears and everything, and everything across the board. So I think it's quite a challenging position in the moment. Julie Malloy wanted to interrupt a sec, Mr Mills, Julie Malloy. Okay. Thank you. We've actually compiled information on behalf of the housing associations in the Scottish borders. Um, and around one in ten tenants in the borders, uh, social housing tenants, are in, on applying for uni uh, receiving universal credit. And we have seen an increase in arrears. And particularly what we're finding is the arrears are approximately a third higher for um, people who are claiming universal credit than other tenants. Um, we've done some specific work in the borders to separate out the, separate out the types of debt. So some of the debt is due to the timing. Um, some of it is about timing of cla claims. Around a third of the debt is what we would call new arrears. So it's people who are SBHA tenants but have accrued new arrears. And of that, about 40% of the debt is technical, 60% isn't. So there's a real challenge for us in terms of, of managing rent arrears. We're all seeing, seeing, uh, also seeing quite dramatic increases in demand on our financial inclusion services. We were dealing with around um, 90 cases this time last year. Our team's now dealing with 176 a month. So um, I think there's a lot of 
although arrays are going up, there was, there's also behind that a lot of complexity and a lot of energy going into the claims service that, that hasn't been required before. Anyone else? Yeah, I, mean, I think there's two aspects of rent arrears or rent debt um, as it affects private rented sector and particularly local authority sector. In terms of the private rented sector, um, increasing arrears or, or the gap between the LHA and, and benefit paid and the rent, which causes arrears, um, is actually causing homelessness. And, and, and that's something that we are particularly concerned about in local authorities. And it's particularly... Um, 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 what was the right term, it's actually affecting more families with children coming into the homelessness system. So that, that's something you can see the national um, picture uh, from the, uh, the, the government statistics. And, you know, the, the adverse impact on children coming into the homeless system is something that clearly we're concerned about and impacting on child poverty and, and other types of poverty. So trying to maintain those families in the private rented sector for as long as possible, and we need to find mechanisms to do that, in terms of that top-up of the rent required, actually is better for the family then to come through a managed route into a social rented tenancy, which is clearly much more affordable. So there is that impact on rent arrears in the PRS sector, as well as landlords not willing to accept uh, households uh, who want that housing option to come into the PRS sector. When we come to local authorities, and, and Fife's given you written evidence uh, on the impact so far of universal credit on... on the housing revenue account and rent arrears. It's in the region of 1.5 million additional arrears uh, on the housing revenue account in Fife. Now, what, what I've also had to do as head of housing with the head of revenues is to, is to try and make sure that we have enough bad debt provision within the revenue account. And we've put an extra million and a half into that in last year, and that will continue in this year. So there comes a point where we're, we're putting the extra resources in to try and help people falling into rent areas, many for the first time. But it now then starts to have an impact on other housing policies that the council wants to follow, particularly new built homes, um, and also trying to develop services for tenants in need. So there is a, a huge challenge there for local authorities and partners to make sure that we work better together to help people, uh, particularly on universal credit. But there comes a point, a tipping point, where it now starts to erode the local authorities' ability to actually commit uh, to building homes within the Strategic Housing Investment Plan in partnership with the Scottish Government. Jeremy uh, Hewitt, did you want to add anything to that? It's, I would just say that the way the system is set up and the five-week wait, you're, um, if you like, you're setting up folk to fail because if you imagine somebody who uh, claimed universe, who applied for universal credit uh, last Monday, the first of April, they have an ass and um, their landlord may have raised a rent debit on the first of April as well. Um, they don't get any money um, until seven days after the assessment period is over which will be into uh, about the 7th of May. So two rent debits will have been set up. So you've already got two months worth of, of rent to be paid. Now the DWP, um, one of the things it, it's um, decided to do to ameliorate the situation is to offer 100% advances, including the rent. Now anecdotal evidence is that um, I think um, claimants aren't perhaps aware that that advance payment also includes a, an obligation to pay the rent. So, in, if you like, you then have an, an additional debt, um, which has got to be paid. Um, and so the, the landlord may just say, well, we won't manage payments to landlords because we've, we've got two months of arrears. Um, the, the tenant has got to pay um, the advance back. And, you know, what may have been um, typically, say, something um, a couple two children with, a, with an average rent would probably get about £888 a month universal credit. So they've got to pay the £888, that's £74 that comes off. If uh, they're in rent, they can have 20% of their personal allowance, that's about another £100. So you're already putting somebody in a, in a struggle of, of indebtedness and you don't know what the back story is. Um, the claimant may have already, because... Of, of the situation they found themselves may be in an overdraft. And even if they get an advance payment, that may be swallowed up by the bank. So you, you are creating, if you like, a, a hole for folk that's going to be very, very hard for them to get out of. Okay. Um, 
I understand it. We take back in the second to pursue some more aspects around rent arrears, but just a note that Mark Griffin, the Deputy Governor, would like some con uh, some supplementaries on that. But you're exploring a line of question just now. We'll take it in a little second, okay? Alistair, do you want to come back in some of that? Okay. Um, in that case, uh, finally, Convener, you, you've clearly drawn a connection. I think most of you, without uh, trying to speak for you, from what you've said, you have drawn a connection between the practice, I think, of, of universal credit being paid in arrears and arrears in rent. You've also drawn a connection between arrears and rent and problems around homelessness. Would it be too much, therefore, for the committee to draw a connection causally between the practice of paying universal credit in arrears and homelessness itself? Paul just, just for clarity, um, universal credit is paid in arrears, but so is housing benefit. And the, the issue is around when the customer receives their payment of universal credit, there's no separation as that's for their housing and that's for their and that's for the living costs. You know, the housing benefit was paid in arrears. It's always been paid in arrears, but it was generally paid direct to the landlord as an automatic, especially in the social sector. The practice in local authorities was very often, if the customer didn't specify that they wanted the payment direct to themselves, we paid it direct to their social sector landlord. In the private sector, it worked slightly a different way. Universal credit just doesn't differentiate for customers and when they receive money they don't really appreciate that that's for that and that's for that because it's one payment to manage in their own in their own way. What Jeremy was saying around um, payments and customers and indebtedness because of the restricted income not necessarily because of universal credit because of the restricted income on the benefit freeze customers income is reducing so when they get money it, the tendency is to maybe not manage it in the best way and that's how arrears build up because they get money in one hand and they forget that 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 and that has to come off because something more priority is pressing upon them um, food for their children new school clothes um, shoes anything else comes up when that money comes in overdrafts take it um, other priority debts come across because obviously doorstep lenders are quick to knock on the door for cash whereas they might be inclined to pay that before they pay they pay their rent and that then results in accumulation of arrears and homelessness okay any other comments on that before we bring in more other msps john mills i don't think we should just focus on universal credit you've got to look at the application of local housing um, allowance rates uh, you've got to look at shared uh, uh, room rates you've got to look at the application of the benefit cap and if if we were to examine the HL1 statistics and, and some issues around the HL1 statistics at the moment that we're trying to refine with um, colleagues in the Scottish Government, if you look at the families and children coming into the homeless system, then many of the applicants say that they have been able to actually top up the rent the landlord requires from what they're getting paid um, through either universal credit or housing benefit. So I think that's a significant impact, and, and I think there is a, a direct causal link in, in the creation of homelessness through that mechanism. I'll take you in a second, Mr Hewer. I'm just conscious of trying to make sure everyone gets an equal amount of time to kind of put stuff on the record. Uh, I know Julie Malloy wants in. I don't know if Gail Ward does, but Julie Malloy just now. OK, thank you. I think it's Im important to acknowledge that a number of people coming into the system are not coming into the system with resources in their pocket, and we've had a few examples of where people have maybe left work unexpectedly or their hours have reduced and they're suddenly in the system with no savings. And that weight is what causes the problem. And when people get the money, they're often to, making choices about bills. Um, there, were, there was a case in, in the borders of um, a family where that happened to them. And immediately the, the money came in. It was a significant payment all the bills were paid and they were left with no money. And, and that wasn't a, 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 a reckless choice. Um, it was about the fear of losing their home, losing, um, not having power, not having um, paying off debts, etc. So I think there is an issue about people aren't always in the position when they claim of having the resources to be able to wait that time and manage it. And there's a lot of dependency on families and wider support. And if that support isn't there, it's really causing problems. And that's taken a lot of work to recover. And we know that the arrangements are available to borrow in advance, but they have implications. And the feedback from um, people working on cases in my organisation was very clearly 
that people often don't understand the complexity and they don't understand the consequences of the loans and the payment arrangements until they actually start coming out. And Gail Ward, did you want to come in and add to that? No, I, I well, would agree pretty much with all uh, the comments. Okay, I know that Jeremy Hewitt and Paula Doherty did. Uh, Jeremy, we'll take you first and then Paula. I was just to follow on from what Paula was saying about the benefit freeze, which I think is a, is a factor. There's also the factor of sanctions, and I think it's it's a combination. It isn't just universal credit. Thank you, Paula Doherty. I was just going on the point um, of John about the LHA rate and the impact of the LHA rate. Within Dumfries and Gallery, we've got 2,000 customers receiving rent in the private sector. 60% of these have a shortfall between the maximum housing benefit, the LHA rate, and their actual rent to be paid. And to quantify that, that's £1.2 million of shortfall. That's money that these families, individuals, have to find out of their own pocket to top up. They will never receive housing costs and universal credit for that. Um, that's the same amount as the 16,000 customers for the, who are impacted by the benefit cap in the private sector. But the private sector is right across the sphere, pensioners, working age, and uh, the whole of the market. So the LHA freeze within Dumfries and Galloway isn't actually continually impacting like Glasgow's submission because our rents are remaining quite stable. But these customers are having to find that money their own, in their own pocket, whether they're on housing benefit, a legacy system or universal credit. OK, thank you. Alan Stalin, before I let our colleagues in, was there anything else? No. Nope. OK, Mark Griffin. Thanks, Kevin. I wanted to continue some of the lines of question around renteries in particular to, to Highlands Council, just because, as you said, Highlands have um, a far longer experience of, of universal credit. I just wanted to ask, um, on rent arrears debt, what has been the, the profile of that debt? Did it, it spike on introduction and tail off? Has it spiked and remained level, or has it spiked and then carried on increasing? I think, I think there's, there's, there's slightly different scenarios based on the different um, universal credit systems. So what we've seen is um, people who went onto the live service universal credit at the very, at the very start, we are now eventually starting to see some of their arrears tailoring off, I think because of the third party deductions to help clear some of the rent arrears. So we're, we're seeing those arrears gradually start to reduce. But with all of the cases, there is that an initial spike of rent arrears at the start of a, of a, of a claim. Um, we, it's probably fair to say that we're seeing slightly lower levels of rent arrears for some of the claimants that have gone on to universal credit since April last year when they brought in some of the benefit changes, um, the two weeks housing benefit run on, etc. So we've got, we've got different tenants probably at different levels of rent arrears, but I think across the board, there is that initial spike. It does start to tailor off a little bit. But what we do see is that if people go in and out of the benefit system, then th they're almost like going in peaks and troughs, depending on when their benefits start and stopping. And we see that quite a lot in Highland because there's quite a lot of um, tourism and um, earnings, people, people going in and out of the sector within tourism, et cetera, over the period of a year. So they might go in and out of the benefits system quite a lot over the period of a year. OK, and we've, we've heard that the, the system of payments from UC from the previous system, it, it's still in our ears, so nothing nothing has changed there. What, as an authority with one of the longest experiences of UC, what is your um, what would be your recommendation on changing that to stop that initial spike in arrears happening? I, th I think definitely the way the payments are made to, to landlords at the moment is, is an unintended consequence of increased rent arrears. We... The 13 payments, I, I, I'm not sure how much you actually know about the, about the system and how it's paid, but the individual customer receives 12 payments over a period of a year. However, a landlord will receive 13 four weekly payments. So there's that misalignment straight away. So there's people going into increased rent arrears as a consequence of the way the payments are actually made. We can quite often wait up to four weeks after the customers had their money before we receive the money, which is at the very, very start of a claim, it could mean that um, we're waiting nine weeks for that first payment to come through if it's a direct payment to the landlord. Um, so we are seeing 
considerable increases that we probably wouldn't see if we'd have retained the payments direct to the landlord at the same point that the customer got them that we saw under live service and that would be our recommendation would be that we would like to see those aligned payments as soon as possible it's probably help reduce re arrears up to four weeks for each individual household depending on how those payments are made okay thank you okay i just wonder if you wanted to extend that to to other other witnesses for what they think the, the solutions yeah. might, might might look like i think it's important maybe you all put put that on the record mr mills so i mean i, I mean i think the, the the obvious thing we would recommend as, as a as a landlord uh, is, is the default should be a, a rent payment direct to landlord uh, and, and that way people are still falling into rent today as well the assessment carries out but the the rent payment is guaranteed to either private landlord or council or housing association landlord and that would give us certainty and it would certainly give the tenant certainty that their rent payments are taken care of although there is an arrear that will eventually be resolved. So uh, uh, th that would take the, the pressure, the risk, away from uh, the roof over your head. Now, now just before we, a we ask other, other, other witnesses in relation to that, because that, that very specific point, because uh, Mr Griffin and myself have raised this a, a number of times, and the conversation eventually comes down to if we have the default position that the, the, the rent goes straight to the landlord, should that then have an opt-out uh, ability for that the claimant to say, well, actually, initially it goes straight to the landlord, but I now want to have the cash myself, or should it just go to the landlord? Gail Ward, and I'll take the rest, re rest of you in to, to answer that as well. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, in, with, with having an opt-out, because we are seeing people that are working who are managing their payments and are paying the rent on time. So I would, I would say that an opt-out should be in there. That said, there still needs to be the safeguards in place around the alternative payment arrangements for those that are maybe unwilling to pay or then struggle to pay at the right time. So I think as long as that safety net is left in place for landlords, so there is a backstop position that we can go back to a direct payment if the customer has asked for the payment direct, but actually they're not paying that over. Without oversimplifying things, there's nothing simple in relation to any of this, but the default position would be rent goes straight to the landlord once that money starts to flow, the claimant have the ability to opt out of that and take the cash directly themselves, but some safeguarding to follow up after that should rent arrears start to accrue and issues um, become transparent at, at that point. I'm not trying to misrepresent what you're saying, I'm just trying to get clarity a, around it. Um, we'll, 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 we'll go from my right to left here, we'll take Paula Doherty first and we'll work along the way. Yes. Universal Credit has alternative payment arrangements in place. I think the, the main point would be is really when they're making an assessment on where the payments are going, they need to be asking the landlord's opinion first. Now, for a customer, they don't have to, they don't even have to tell the landlord their own um, Universal Credit. If they're paying their rent, there's, there's no issue. When we have an alternative payment arrangement in housing benefit and the customer comes to us and asks to revert, the first port of call is to check with the landlord that it's okay to revert. Administratively, the DWP seem to miss that step. So customer choice is as easy as updating their journal saying, I'd like my housing costs to go to me. You know, the Scottish choice comes in, would you like your housing costs to pay to your landlord? Yes, I would. Get a bit short, think they need some money for something else because the overall benefit freeze leaves them over short. Um, update their journal, have their housing costs paid direct to themselves. Landlord's not requested any information about that they're not checking with the landlord is this a good idea is the customer made an arrangement with you and how they're going to pay their rent um, payments just directly go back to the tenant landlord then finds out the tenant doesn't pay back back around that circle again the alternative payment arrangements are in place to support customers but what we're finding operationally is that dwp are not doing that from the first payment regardless of whether that information is there it's probably due to speed but within the law, they are obligated to consider the alternative payment arrangements because the landlords very often put that marker straight in when they're verifying the rent and um, don't pay customer direct pay, pay to us. Just, just for clarity, though, um, would, would your uh, position uh, be that um, rather than seeking alternative payments, the, alternative, the initial alternative payment would be requesting it to go to yourself 
but it would go by default initially to the landlord. Would that be your position, Paula Doherty? Just for clarity, Dumfries and Galloway doesn't have any housing stock. I'm here as a, a benefit representative in the, in right. the administration of housing oh. benefit okay. and knowledge of universal credit. My position would be the landlord would be the default position um, and the landlord needs to be checked with the landlord, particularly in the social sector, need to check with the landlord whether or not they're okay with it going to the tenant. But remember, it is the customer's benefit and it's the customer's obligation to pay their rental liability. It's just many customers find that challenging. Thank you very much. Jeremy Hewer. I think um, the, it is the custom of uh, housing benefit that uh, on the housing benefit application form, there is a, a, a section that sort of says um, your rent, will, your housing benefit will be paid direct to your landlord or tick a box if, if, if you prefer to receive it directly. I think that's I exactly what we want. Uh, the default position would, would be um, our preference, but um, tenants should have the option um, to make a ch change. But the safeguard, I think, is one of the um, innovations that the DWP did was when they rolled out the landlord portal was to also make um, social landlords trusted partners. So you would have a situation that if somebody presented themselves and wanting um, housing, um, sorry, universal credit, and they were given the option to say, well, uh, does it, do you want to pay direct to your landlord or do you want to receive it? And they said, I want to receive it. But there was an issue around them perhaps having addiction problems or something. So there was a concern what the DWP term, the tier one factors or tier two factors. The landlord as part of the verification say, we want an alternative payment arrangement put in place from the get go. Now, that in theory will, will give us a safeguard. The trouble is, I think, um, in practice, it, it's been rather haphazard. It hasn't been as, as efficient as it should be. But if it could be made to be efficient, that would be what we would want to see. And Julie Malloy. Thank you. I would reinforce what, what Jeremy said. We would support a default payment to the landlord. We've had lots of feedback in our casework that that's what people would prefer um, with that flexibility as existed under housing benefit to claim. I think as well the portal could be put to more use. Again, if, if the system is simple, if the payment is coming through, then in the more complex places we can put more time and support into those situations that require advice and support and verification. Um, we are a trusted partner. I think the only thing we can't predict is how people will behave in the system um, and different people are going to behave differently but by sharing information, working together with partners, um, we can manage the risks in certain situations and work preventatively to avoid arrears and eviction. Okay, just before I move to Deputy Convener, Mark Griffin, do you want to come back in any of that? No. Um, Polly McNeill. Thank you. Um, I have a supplementary to John, and then I want to move on to a more substantive issue about those in work. Um, John, I know that you said in your answer, I think, to Alistair Allen, um, that the issue of rent arrears was impacting on house building programmes. I just wondered if you could just elaborate briefly on that. What, what we depend on as a local authority is um, a, a mix of uh, borrowed uh, funding from uh, Public Sector Loans Board as well as Scottish Government subsidy to build a new uh, council home, a social rented home. We've got to work within the parameters of our 30-year housing revenue account business plan and that works to prudential limits. So we've got to make sure that we get rental income coming into the housing revenue account uh, to fuel services to actually uh, pay back the mortgage for, for building new homes. And any threat to that from a lowering of rental income or an increase in rent arrears, um, we've then got to make um, other uh, financial provisions within our business plan and report that regularly to elected members through committee. So if rent arrears continue to increase at the rate that they are currently increasing in Fife, we will reach uh, what we call a tipping point within the business plan where I've got to go to the elected members and say we can no longer afford to borrow at the level we need to build the homes that we've agreed with the Scottish Government in our strategic housing investment plan. And housing associations will be in the same uh, point. So uh, although we've not reached that point yet, it's putting an increasing strain on the housing revenue account and the housing revenue account business plan 
which will make us more cautious about borrowing new money uh, to not, not only build homes, but improve homes up to the statutory standard. So there is that potential risk there that people across the country are analysing their, through regular reviews of the, their business plans. Thank you. And just for clarity, the tipping point that you might get to or the sort of increase in rent arrears, is that down to the universal credit system or not? I think, I think we have to be um, up front and say that rent arrears before the introduction of universal credit were increasing. Uh, and and th that's uh, about a number of reforms, not just universal credit, but part of the wider uh, position. And, and tenants have been finding themselves in, in, in difficult uh, debt positions uh, before uh, the change from housing benefit to universal credit. So, but what we find with universal credit is an accelerated increase of rent arrears overall and has put people that had never been in rent arrears before because they'd been covered through housing benefit now into a rent arrear position and that causes clearly um, sure. stress and, 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 and uh, mental health issues as Thank well. Thank you, that, that's helpful. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to move on to the submission um, from the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations. Um, Jeremy, there's a quite a significant section about when work does not pay I wanted to ask you about. Um, so in your submission, you say that with a significant number of people, as we know, are in work and claiming universal um, credit, 32%, um, I think is the figure that's in your, in your paper. Um, you go on to say that in January 2019, the High Court found that the automated assessment process used by the DWP was unlawful. Could you just speak to that so I fully understand it? Um, this was a case that was brought... Um, by the Child Poverty Action Group and um, Lee Day Solicitors. Um, and it was to do with, um, I think, four single parents who were um, in monthly, in employment, and were paid monthly. But it was one of these things where um, their payment, the, their salary dates clashed with, um, or, or didn't work well with their assessment dates. So I think it's, it's this thing that the DW, um, sort of the way the system has been set up, um, typically at Christmas, is that if somebody is paid early, um, that the, uh, it's disregarded, if you like, for the period that, that payment is for. It's when that pay payment comes in. So folk were having two monthly payments in one period and therefore they were not getting any universal credit. And in fact, that universal credit may claim may have been closed down because it, because the amount of money. And this is one of the, the real, if you like, running issues with universal credit is, um, I would, although the DWP is adamant that most people are paid monthly, I would contend, well, that may be so, but I would say a significant minority are probably not paid monthly um, who, rely on universal credit, they're in precarious employment, they're in casual employment, zero hours contract, etc. So um, I think, as, as Julie said earlier, it's very, very hard for people to budget because the, the, money, the money coming in is, is erratic. And also the, the point is that if the money uh, comes in and you lose the universal credit because the way you've set up, because you have an in-work allowance, if you can't use that in-work allowance the next month because you haven't got any money in because it was, um, if you like, in, in the previous um, assessment period, you may not benefit, so you may lose out. So it isn't a case of, oh, you will get your money eventually. You might get your money eventually, but perhaps it will be less than it. And uh, the Child Poverty Action Group has done a lot of research on this. They produced um, a publication called Rough Justice. And this particular court case, I think, was um, the decision came out about the end of January this year. Are you able to tell the committee what the implications of that judgment are, if it was? Um, I'm not expert enough to okay. say what, what, what they are. I mean, it's... It depends whether, I don't even know whether the DWP has decided to uh, appeal it because I think the judgment was the, what the, D, the way the DWP was ass assessing things was unlawful. Our argument would be that in everything, the DWP in, in doing its assessment needs to take into account, if you like, when an income comes in and, and, and when it... Now, housing associations this financial year or social landlords this financial year are also being faced with a problem because... Um, if they charge weekly, um, the next financial year, um, 
1990, I, I think is a 53 week year. So there's going to be 53 week uh, rent payments. Now the DWP on one side says, um, because some landlords offer rent free weeks. So they may only charge 48 times a year. Uh, the DWP says, ah, you're charging 48 times a year. So we're going to take that weekly charge multiply it by 48 and divide it by 12, and that's the amount you get. So it, it, it evens out. They're not doing that the other way around, though, which um, strikes us as strange. Just before we move on from that, I saw Paula Doherty was, was looking to come in. I don't know if you get a bit more information in relation to, to, to some of this. The, the case um, in question around the single parents is the they didn't receive earnings in an assessment period, therefore didn't benefit from a work allowance. The impact for them would have been 63% of around 190, £192 pounds a month, um, which is the work allowance for a single parent. The, the issue that the DWP have stated is that universal credit is worked on when you actually get paid the money, not when you earn the money. Housing benefit is calculated on when you earn the money. This benefits a significant number of customers because if you start work today and monthly paid, you may not actually get it, your monthly pay until the 15th of next month. So your universal credit would stay up because you're not, you're not earning yet. Then when you do earn the money, then it, it reduces. The DWP's position on this case about being unlawful is universal credit was intended to change behaviour. And what they are expecting employers to do is not mess around with the date that customers are paid. In Dumfries and Galloway, I get paid on the 15th of the month. My pay slip always says the 15th of the month. If the 15th of the month is a Monday, Sunday or Saturday, I get paid on the Friday. It doesn't change that I get paid on the 15th of the month. And the employers in this case didn't adhere to that fashion. They said, we normally pay you on the 30th of the month, but because it's Christmas, we're going to pay you on the 25th. They didn't issue that payment through the HMRC system as being paid on the 30th and just bank the money on the 25th. They updated their record and said they're paid on the 25th. Um, it's a significant impact for a number of customers. The way that Universal Credit treats earnings, just on the point of earnings, is their Universal Credit will adjust as their earnings adjust. So for families, there isn't a stability in their income. Whereas just now, the housing benefit would probably be an average and we would pay housing benefit on a constant average of their earnings and their tax credits would be a constant position. Universal credit as their earnings go up was come down and if their earnings go down goes up. So the customers are not saying, oh, I'll get my tax credits, it's 200 pounds and I'll get it on that date. They'll not ever really know as their earnings fluctuate how much they're going to get until the day it's paid. I've understood quite a bit of that. What I'm not clear about is what, is, what does the judgment mean? Is it helpful or unhelpful to that? The judgment is requesting that the, the DWP take a better view on that. Um, really, in the regulations for universal credit, I'm not entirely sure how they can take a better view on that. Really, what they need in their automated system, the HMRC sends through a feed around the earnings that have been paid by that customer, what they've lost in that is the sense check, the sense check that previously existed in an unautomated system on earnings, whereas you looked at something and you thought, all right, that's just because they've had back money, that's just because it's Christmas. They've right. asked for common sense, we put. But a common sense works when you've got a decision maker at every monthly assessment period. When it's an automated system, there won't be a decision maker. Just lastly, I mean, the... the, the the, your, your submission and certainly the Scottish Federation of Housing Association suggesting that there are what Paula Doherty describes are incidents where work may not pay for a lot of people. I just wondered if you wanted to comment on that. That would be one of my primary concerns is that universal credit for people who are in work and have been in work um, may be detrimental to a lot of people. Customers who are in work generally receive more universal credit than they would have received under legacy because work is, is treated, um, the 63% taper on earnings is much more favourable to customers. Um, when we're doing some initial workings out, a customer in employment is generally around £25 a week better off on universal credit than they would have been under legacy systems. The difficulty is the fluctuation of that income and the way that universal credit treats earnings is different than the way housing benefit treated earnings. There are winners and losers 
in that method. And I think what we find is the cases that are brought forward are the losers, whereas you never hear about the, the winners. Okay. So, does anyone else want to... I, I, I totally acknowledge that there are some winners, but there's, there must be quite a lot of losers as well, because we've been in work and have been... And, and child tax credit, as you know, is, is, is a big issue in terms of migration. Must, they must be big losers for people in work, surely? Yeah, I know Julie Malloy wants to comment on that. And just, uh, just to flag up, if you can tie any of this back to housing costs and how Social Security does or doesn't support housing costs, that's helpful in terms of eventual conclusions uh, to this particular inquiry, Julie Malloy. Thank you. I, I, um, a, an example of a case that maybe illustrates this, um, and I have to say, sitting, talking to people who are dealing with cases every day, it's an illustration of several cases. Um, and it highlights what um, Gail was talking about in terms of rural areas and um, seasonal work. And um, it's a, a young woman on a zero, zero hours contract. Um, she applied for universal credit. Um, she was pregnant. Her working hours fell. She was told she wasn't entitled to universal credit. It turned out she was. Um, she ended up with £20 a week to live on. Um, and I think, you know, we, we will hear about the worst cases because we are dealing with some really difficult situations. Um, so her situation was her housing costs couldn't be paid. She was borrowing money from relatives out, out of the area. Um, it, with support and advocacy, we could deal with that situation if people understood it and understood the complexity and what their rights were and with consistent information and advice I think we could support people through the system in a stronger way so um, you know we do see we have a lot of cases where incomes are going up and down and often um, the rent can be, be the last thing on the list um, and the reliability of that and the changes in incomes are really causing pressure on, on individuals and particularly families. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jeremy Balfour. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I've got two kind of clarification questions and then one new area to explore briefly. Um, if we go back to, I think, uh, forget me, if I, I think it was Jeremy that said that the system is set up that people can, DWP will pay that rent on the day that they apply, and it then has to be paid off over that 12-month period. But you said people don't seem to be aware of that. Do you think that's because DWP aren't telling people? Or, 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 or where is that breakdown of communication happening? Or are people hearing that but just deciding they don't want to take that system? Sorry, um, in, in what context was it? So this is when you apply for universal credit in regard to your house and you, your rent being paid. Uh, the DWP will make that upfront payment on that day, and then you pay that off over that 12-month period. And so I think you said payment. that, that there seems to be a breakdown on communication, that people aren't aware of that. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, is that because DWP aren't telling people? Is that because <clears throat> it's too complicated for people to understand? Or are people hearing it but just choosing not to go down that road? Probably all three. Um, I've, I think there is um, a failure of, of communication, of you know, um, understanding what the, what the advance payment uh, covers. Um, I think also it, it needs to be borne in mind that, that people applying for a universal credit are, aren't coming from a good place necessarily. They've either had a relationship breakdown, they've had a bereavement, they've lost their job, um, and so. Trying to take it in. Um, I mean, I've been um, playing around with universal credit, if you like, since 2013, and I still find it quite complex. As somebody who's coming into it brand new, um, it must be a very, very daunting um, prospect. So it, it, it's about getting that advice. And uh, understandably, the DWP wants to try and automate things as much as possible to keep the actual processing costs down to a minimum. Um, it's just that I, I do think that... Um, there needs to be more support and I think it's, it's understanding if you like that um, universal credit is there to support the people who need it it isn't there to um, as an administrative convenience for those who run it <clears throat> I just wonder if anyone else had an experience do you think it's a lack of information at that first point is the issue 
I, th I think there's a little bit of all three, as, as Jeremy said. I think from my experience um, initially was people have taken advances and because they've had to pay it back and it's caused them financial hardship over a period of time, that message gets delivered out to their peers um, and then there's maybe a reluctance for people to take up on those advances um, further, further down the line. I think the impact as well that if they've got other deductions, other overpayments that need to be repaid, ultimately, if they're losing 40% of their income, at the, as it is at the moment, then that, that's quite a barrier to stop people from wanting to take those advance payments in the first place. John Mills, did you want to add? Yeah, I, mean, I think part, part of the issue here is, um, if you look at Housing Benefit Administration, that was actually um, managed by local authorities. So even where there was miscommunication or lack of communication, it's something that a housing department could actually rectify quite closely because we work very closely with colleagues and local authorities. If you're dealing with a call centre at length, uh, arm's length, some arm's length, um, uh, away from your local authority, even when we apply for direct payments on behalf of, of tenants, um, we're never told the outcome of that uh, decision. Uh, so there's no communication back to the landlord and then uh, the tenant is, is probably unaware uh, of what's happening until they receive their payment. Um, we're also aware that we receive payments, uh, um, rent costs uh, or housing cost payments from Universal Credit that actually belongs to another council. So, so, so there are quite an, a, a number of clerical errors as DWP uh, terms them and, and DWP requests for that payment back. We just simply appeal it because we have no means of tracing it. So I think, I think that morass for a council or a housing association would be doubly so for a, for a tenant, a new tenant. So what we've got to try and do to actually uh, mitigate that, that, that loss of a decision taking locally is to put more people on the ground to work face-to-face, -face, much closer with people in a, in a range of tenures, but primarily in their own tenancies, so that we can actually make sure that we're holding their hand right throughout uh, the process. And clearly that's a resource uh, issue for uh, housing organisations. So that, that, that's the impact, not just the, the human impact on, on the household in terms of added stress and anxiety, indebtedness, but it's actually stressing the whole system so that we feel that you know, we can't support tenants in the, in the way we should, we simply just need better communication through the DWP. And I think the landlord portal has real potential to enable us to do that if it was developed in the way that it should be. So there are a number of challenges, but there are also a number of uh, solutions that we've already put forward that doesn't seem to be getting traction. So that, that's what we are concerned about as, as, as local authorities. Jeremy, we'll bring maybe other witnesses in for their comments as well. I'm conscious you mentioned the landlord portal there, and it's probably quite helpful to get some information on the record in relation to that when the answer if that's okay but Julie Malloy wanted to come in. Okay thank you. Um, I, I think one of the issues in terms of take up is the consistency of communication and um, there is a distinct feeling around the contact locally which can be extremely positive. We work together, we share issues um, with the local, um, the local teams. Um, the service centres can be more remote and, and very much care, the relationship is very much casework rather than a sort of general relationship. Dealing with that for 500 people um, is a challenge. When that maybe becomes over 2,000 people, it's going to be a significant challenge. So I think there could be a stronger relationship between the service centres and um, particularly one of the things um, my colleagues in, in Berkshire Housing Association have raised is most of us are working with the Dundee Service Centre um, for people living in places like Coldstream and Paxton, they're dealing with Middlesbrough. So knowledge of the Scottish system maybe isn't as consistent as it could be. So the, I think there could be work to be done there around the consistency of message um, and um, local, localised campaigns according to issues in that area. Any other comments, Paul Docker, did you want to come in? Um, it was just around the advance payment. It's really around customer behaviour and the fact that we've had you know, a, a significant length of time since 1986 where housing benefit has been administered by local authorities. Um, customers are not used to receiving or de dealing with the DWP for their housing, housing issues. Housing is a devolved matter um, and housing benefit is not a devolved matter. Universal credit housing costs being paid in the advance payment is something customers are not expecting. And the, 
back to Jeremy's point around there are three reasons why people don't then pay that money over. Either they don't understand they're just not going to, or um, they've got other uses for the money. But they're just not used to receiving money in their hand for housing. What they get at the minute in housing benefit is money goes to their landlord for their housing. Checking just clarification points, and it's really back to, I think, Jeremy and Paula again. Uh, oh, let, let's take the view that the committee took the presumption that the money should go straight to the landlord, but still have the opt-out that if you wanted it. I, I was a wee bit confused. Were you saying that the landlord would have a veto? So if I opt-out to take the money myself, are you arguing that the landlord should then be able to say, no, that they're not paying the rent, it should come straight to me, even if the claimant says, I want that money. Those are the existing rules at the moment. Um, managed payment to landlords can be for one of two reasons. One is that there's an excess of two months rent arrears. The other is if um, a tenant, there may not be rent arrears, but um, the claimant has got uh, vulnerabilities, and these is what they call the tier one, tier tier two vulnerabilities. And the idea is if you've got a tier one uh, vulnerability, which is something like addiction problems, then um, the landlord can legitimately ask for that money. And even if the uh, individual says, no, I want the money paid to me direct, um, the DWP will say, no, um, you know, f to protect you, your money, uh, uh, the managed payment is going to be put in for, for the landlord. I mean, I think a lot of the problem is, I mean, you mentioned, um, I don't know if we're going to be discussing the landlord portal more, but it's one of the real inadequacies of the system are, are, are the systems underpinning universal credit, which are just not fit for purpose at the moment. Um, you'll have heard about the, um, the managed payments, how they come in on a four weekly basis and the fact that the money can sometimes be misposted to uh, uh, other landlords and things like that. A lot of that is to do with the fact that um, the systems aren't automated as the way they should, should have been by the DWP as yet. And you've got two different systems. You've got the universal credit system and you've got the third party creditor system. And when they were set up, there was very little discussion, we suspect, between the two, between the two sides. And that's one of the reasons for the incompatibility. And our suspicion is that there's a heavy reliance on manual processing, which is why you're getting reference numbers transposed. You're getting, sometimes you're not getting the reference numbers at all. You're getting national insurance numbers. Um, there's supposed to be suffixes uh, as ascribed to each payment, um, um, uh, MP for managed payment or AR for arrears. Uh, sometimes they're missing and they're quite frequently in uppercase and lowercase. Now, no computer system decides, oh, shall I use an uppercase or shall I use a lowercase? It's because some, some poor soul in the bowels of the DWP is having to type all this stuff in. And inevitably, there's going to be human error. Now, when it's, you know, in the early stages of universal credit, you could say, fine, okay, you know, that's one of the things we'll get around. We haven't got that money, um, you know, that many cases. But we're going to scale now. We're going to huge, um, you know, huge numbers. And ultimately, um, a reasonable assumption is that most social landlords will have about 40% of their tenants will be reliant on universal credit. So mediums, average size association, about 2,000, that's 800 souls on universal credit. Now, are you going to be dependent on ringing up um, the DWP on each individual once? No, you don't want that. You want the information on the landlord portal. And there's information that the DWP can disclose now without explicit consent and anything. If that was all on the uh, portal as a default, it would be, make such a difference. It's things like the start date of housing payments being paid to the landlord, when the landlord can expect the payment, and the amount of the next payment that's coming in, which is a very important thing considering that universal credit is also an in-work benefit, so the amount of housing costs awarded may vary from month to month. To my original question, and that is, I, I understand that there is a system that certain individuals, even if they don't want it, goes to it. Are you saying that should be for every individual? That's what I'm trying to put you on. Because you have one of those categories where, you know, if you are not going to pay your rent, it definitely, you know, even if you choose to take the money, you don't get that choice. 
But are you, are you arguing that a landlord, whoever the individual is, whatever the circumstances are, should have that right of veto? No, a, a right of veto. I mean, they've, they've got to have reasonable cause for that veto. Time constraints, can I just check? Because apparently there's, there's, it's not the right to veto. Is this the safeguarding procedures that you referred to where existing DWP practice is there tier one or tier two vulnerabilities or concerns yeah. or issues and if those can be evidenced by the landlord then you can persuade DWP irrespective of the claimant's views mm. to have that money go direct to landlords. Yeah. So I don't think you're talking well, about I, something I, new. My question is should that be extended? Should that should we get rid of the categories and should the landlord be able to say whoever the individual is? No. I want that. No, actually, I was just that was just, I, no. I was unclear. No, no, they've got that. That's what have, you were saying. No, so, so without, it, without it, safeguarding the general cause. power of veto, is yes, that what you're yeah, but, but that was what I thought you were saying, okay. and I just wanted to no, clarify. No, it's so, good cause, and also I would emphasise that in those cases, um, they're reviewed. They, it, it isn't. It isn't sort of forever and ever. The DWP would expect. Well, is that person in a uh, uh, individual in a position to take on the responsibility uh, themselves. Understood you, that's my point. Yeah. But the one I just wanted to throw out to everyone, and my final point is, um, and this may be an issue more for, for Edinburgh Malovians, is the whole question of having to pay the deposit. And has, is that an issue that you're facing and what ways are Highland or um, Fife or Dumfries mitigating that? Is, is there some way that you're helping um, tenants who maybe are struggling to get the deposit to pay a private landlord. It, uh, have you got schemes around that? And is that working or not working? How could that be helped? John, I know you had been keen to come in at the tail end of the last line of questioning, so if you want to mop that up and then move on to this new yeah, question, yeah. that would be helpful. I mean, I don't think we are suggesting the landlord, um, whoever the landlord is, the private or, or council or housing association, should have a right of veto. I think we're just conscious that the housing journey for many families and households in Scotland has transition points. So if you're a young care leaver coming out of uh, care through the local authority and moving into your first home, you need time to actually adjust to income, to expenditure within that household. So at key transition points, what we're suggesting, certainly from a local authority point of view, is that there should be a default of that payment to the landlord until you get settled. Because we, as part of the annual return on the Charter in Scotland, all social landlords measure tenancy sustainment over the first 12 months, and that's a quite a critical uh, measure of how we're getting on with our tenants. So the landlord relationship with the tenant is quite critical. We would never overpower or take away the right of the tenant to make a, a decision. Once they've got that settled position, they know what their, um, how their housing costs are being covered, etc. And then, of course, they can opt out. I think, I think if, if, there, if, if we give um, people all of the money and they're not exactly sure how to portion that in terms of our household budget and recognise the priority of, or, or, or the, the requirement of having to pay for the rent, then that's where things uh, get into a downward spiral. And from a variety of reasons, maybe eviction or maybe they just abandon the tenancy, it ends up in failure for everyone and they go on the homelessness cycle. Uh, in terms of rent deposits, I mean, I think most uh, housing organisations, central local authorities, uh, support voluntary sector rent deposit schemes. Uh, and those schemes work uh, pretty well and good relationships with private landlords are sustained. But as ever, we need to put more money into that as uh, more people seek to access the private rented sector. OK, anyone else? Well, Gail Ward, do you want yeah, to add anything? I was just going to reaffirm the Highland position. The, we've got a deposit guarantee scheme which we are currently reviewing as part of our rapid rehousing transition plan. So it, it's probably been quite underutilised over a period of time because there's been a reluctance from the private rented sector to engage with people on benefits. So we're currently reviewing that at the moment to see what we can do going forward. And see, just before other witnesses come in, because I think Jeremy, if I remember rightly, a line of question we had over the last few weeks was about the monies that's actually in the social security system, whether that's UK government, Scottish government, monies local authorities are putting in, and in terms of some of the constraints and rent deposit schemes in terms of the available houses, the, 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 a ceiling on the amount of deposit that can be given to, to a, a potential applicants and whether there's a better or more innovative use to get money out of the system that's been spent anyway to better support 
um, the use of the private sector and better support rent deposits. So whether you've got changes you'd like to suggest just now or reflect on, uh, we'd really welcome to look at that because it's not just about mitigating or addressing concerns, it's about is there different ways we can just do things as well, I think is, is really important. Um, so I think what Gail Ward mentioned there, Julia Malloy, and we'll, we'll go along the line if there's any additional comments you want to make. No, I'm fine, uh, we have a rent Paul deposit guarantee that. scheme within Dumfries and Galloway, but the discretion and housing payment regulations also allow landlord, local authorities to pay rent deposits and rent in advance under existing legislation. The, the difficulty with that is but rents in advance by design is something that they should get back later, whereas the discretionary housing payments don't come back. So there's a, a restriction on the value of that. When we were paying rent deposits and rents in advance, it was, ended up being a significant amount of money going to customers to pay their rent deposit and rent in advance. And then they would move on to their next tenancy and come back for another one. Whereas really, you're, well, you should have had that one back. And your rent in advance, you should have now back in your hand. So the policy decision in, in relation to the constrained fund is that we don't currently do that unless there are exceptional circumstances. Um, rent deposit guarantees where we send customers over there. Yeah, thank you. Jeremy Hurd, did you want to add anything? I think so to that. Okay. Jeremy Balfour? No, I'm done. Thank you, Kavina. Okay. Michelle Ballantyne. Morning, everybody, and thank you. It's been interesting so far. Um, just so really for, for clarification, because obviously I think Julia, as yourself, that said, you know, you deal with the, the most vulnerable element of our society who, who, where things go wrong, they really do go wrong for them. But so that I can just get a handle on what volume we're talking about in terms of your tenants. Um, Julia, you gave us some figures. I think one in 10 was claimants. Is that right? We've got about 515 out of just over five and a half thousand at the moment. Right, and a third of those have got arrears, new arrears coming in. Sorry, I'll get my statistics. Of the of the new arrears, mm -hmm. um, we have um, fifty percent of the people who receive universal credit have a debt, and um, a third of the debt that we have related to them is new arrears. Right, so that's... Okay, so 50% um, of the one in 10 have yeah. arrears. And, and a third of them. So around... Is new arrears. Yeah, around okay. a third have... have and of that, then, 40% was technical and 60% yeah, was, was failure to pay for whatever reason. Or that claims... That there's sometimes... It's, it's not necessary that people are, uh, are keeping the money, and what we're actually finding is it's people who maybe are in circumstances where they haven't claimed at the right time or um, that there's been a problem with claims. So we carry quite a high caseload of um, debt that may get paid, but we're not quite sure. There's a lot of uncertainty. You're not referring... So that you don't include that in the technical debt, then, where there's been a The technical a debt is where issue. we know there's a claim and we can see it on the portal. Right, OK, and it's just a delay. Yeah, we have other cases where maybe people have been told they're not entitled, but they are. You know, mm -hmm. some sort mm -hmm. of odd cases mm -hmm. where... Maybe um, income's been misread, like a monthly income was misread mm -hmm. as an annual income, okay. um, which meant people were classed as unenti not entitled. So there's quite a lag there, but there's not certainty. Right. And I think that comes back to the portal and information. And the broader information, the more we can kind of risk manage those situations mm -hmm. and understand um, whether that is a technical debt or a real debt. OK, so, so the, the, the tenants you're having difficulties in, in terms of, of the management of the benefits, uh, what does that work out at sort of in value? One percent, two percent? Um, it's, it's, it's around, um, I think it's around £60,000. No, I meant in so percentage of your, of your tenants. Percentages, it's around one percent. About one percent of, of your tenants. And is that area. the same for all of you? Roughly. Ballpark. <laughs> We've got, three, we've got 3,000 tenants on universal credit out of 14,000 housing stock. 60% right. um, of those, give or take, are in, are in some level of rent raise, so we would deem all of those as being vulnerable in some way, shape or form. The actual impact on individual tenants is probably considerably lower than of that 60% who need a high level of input and resource to be able to resolve some of the issues that are going on for them. 
and the others. Um, we've given you a, a submission. I mean, we've, we've, the current figures we've got at the end of February, uh, we have 6,226 tenants, five council tenants, on UC, uh, with a total arrears value of 1.537 million. Now, we believe that another 8,000 tenants will move on to universal credit over the next period, which will be about 45% of our um, tenanted stock of about 30,000 homes. So we anticipate rent arrears increasing, doubling, certainly due to universal credit. What I'm trying to establish is, is what level of, what percent of your tenants have that support need, that you know, vulnerable support need? Because what I want to go on and then ask is around the support that's actually in, pro, in place, because obviously we're moving over to the new Help to Claim programme, um, which will you know, change the way people are being supported maybe for the better, may not be. I've heard mixed views from, from different quarters on it. And I'm just wondering what your view is in terms of that support, you know, given the percentage that you potentially have, what's the impact of all? I think the help, the, help, the help to claim process is around getting the claim into payment, whereas really what we find is that customers, once their claim is in payment, have difficulty. So it's at a later point. You know, putting the claim in and getting the payment. Their first payment is generally not the difficult time for customers. It's managing their income as they go forward. And the help to claim process isn't designed to help these customers. Right. On, because Michelle's mentioning you help, help to claim process, will this address the five week wait? Will that address payments not going to landlords? Will that address the doubling of rent arrears that John Mills is, 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 is suspects may happen in his local authority area? Uh, John Mills, if you, I mentioned you, it should take you first, I suppose. I mean, we have a really good relationship with Citizens Advice, uh, Advice Rights Fife, and, and clearly they change uh, to um, uh, the way that, that um, uh, claimants are helped. Um, we, we will try and do our best with the uh, Citizens Advice Bureau uh, across, across Scotland, I'm sure. What, what, what we are doing is we, we can't take risk with this. So what, what we've actually done is Dundee, I believe, have got a, and they call it a tenant hardship fund for the first period of universal credit. I don't particularly like that term hardship, but we, we are, we've now developed and just about to implement a million pound scheme in five so that the housing revenue account helps with new universal credits with the first two weeks of rent payment. So if they get a follow through in housing benefit for two weeks, we will pay another two weeks rent so that they're not getting into so serious arrears during that first period. But again, that's still uh, less rental income that, that we're bringing in. So we're wanting to target that to people who we know already, having assessed their support needs, will find it more difficult to keep budgeting. Will that flip, in effect, the rental payment to an advance payment rather than an arrears payment? In, in uh, yes, it's, it's us terms, trying then. to uh, ameliorate the, 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 mm -hmm. the fall into rent arrears, which is really stressing for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So that will be a, it's not a, a, an advance which we ask back, it's a grant basically. It will be paid as an allowance uh, through, through their rent account. Universal credit and pay their rent, they'll be paying in advance as opposed to arrears. So it in effect flips that. Yeah, but what we would prefer um, is for um, the, the first payments of housing costs to default to the landlord so that we can ma maintain that better management with the tenants. But I, we've not got that yet, so we're taking steps to try and help tenants who are falling into arrears for the first time through universal credit. Perhaps in relation to that, Gail Ward, did you want to come in? I, th I think from my personal perspective of, of, of the last five years is the more investment that we can put into the start of the claim then the more successful it's, it's likely to be at the start because um, going back to Paula's comment about um, people not being used to having money for, their, money for their rent, we see a huge amount of cases where people just cannot um, let go of that legacy while I claim my help towards my rent through housing benefit. So we see a lot of cases that don't actually claim housing costs at the very start. So I would like to see that the help to claim helps reduce some of that and actually we're getting claims right from the very, very start, which then lessens the resource requirement further down the line to try and put, thing, to try and put things right. However, in saying that, I do think the issue about that ongoing support is, is, is one of the biggest issues that we face. Um, I also oversee housing support provision for Highland, and we've probably got three to 400 people that receive ongoing housing support. And anecdotally, the information that's coming back from those commission services is, 
it's the requirement to help people maintain their universal credit claim as opposed to dealing with other issues that, that seems to be the biggest challenge at the moment. So um, hopefully some invest, the earlier investment that we've got will help lessen some of that going forward. Can we just mop up some other views before I let you back in, Michelle, of course. Uh, any additional views, Jeremy Hewer? I think we're um, helped to claim having a more holistic approach um, to supporting claimants is, is um, welcome. However, th th there are um, two big uh, caveats. One is that the money that's gone into help to claim has been taken from the universal support delivered locally, and there were some services there that were quite good, and they're now not, they're no longer funded. The other thing is, and, and it's been emphasised, is the ongoing support. Um, as a colleague, I think, from in, um, Inclusion Scotland said to me, you know, if somebody's got vulnerabilities, their vulnerabilities do not suddenly disappear when they get the first payment. And it's about maintaining the claim. And I think that's, if there has been some research done uh, down south with, with um, um, Curo Housing Association, which is based in Bath, which was looking at the issue of, of arrears and universal credit. And one of the things they found out was that there was um, a, a break in time before when somebody may have been eligible for universal credit and they're actually claiming it, either because sometimes they thought, well, I'm going to get a job next week, so I won't bother to claim. Or, as I said, the, the, it was a family breakdown or something that, 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 if you like, got in the way of making the claim. And because there's uh, no backdating, really, as, as, as such with the universal credit, that, if you like, set set the tone for, for, the, for the subsequent claim. So if help to claim can prevent that, that would be great. But um, I think there's concerns about some uh, bureau um, aren't open all the time in areas, so there's a heavy reliance, I think, in, on web chat and, and, and phone, and perhaps some of the claimants, um, web chat and phone is perhaps not the, the best medium for them. And you know, we're also getting anecdotal feedback from associations that there's a long waiting list for folk to see for a face-to-face -face interview with CAB, so it's, it, it's how, if you like, the existing CAB services and the help to claim CAB services are meld committee can better understand help to claim, I think it's really important you, you've raised it, Michelle, is I think you were saying, Mr Hewer, that some of the funds that's going to support the partnership with citizens' advice were being given previously to local authorities, so therefore it's not necessarily a new service, it's a new service partnership, so there might be nothing in itself new hmm. in relation to this, I think that's important to establish, and the second thing that's important to establish would be whether help to claim in itself actually does anything to change the structures that you've raised concerns with today, uh, as welcome as help to claim will be. I think it's just important to, to make sure we understand it properly. Can you just confirm some of that, Mr Hewer? Um, as I understand it, um, the £39 million pounds that um, was uh, given to set up help to claim, that that was coming from the universal support delivered locally, uh, the money that had previously gone to universal support delivered locally. It's helpful, and just in Mr. Mills, do you want to come yeah, in? I'll go for you. I mean, that's exactly what's happened. From April 2019, uh, DWP have removed 182,000 from Fife Council because we had put that into local services for budgeting and support. So, you know, that that's how help to claim is being funded. Really, uh, is that kind of uh, um, uh, challenge to to local services? So, what we are doing in Fife is actually putting those services back in at additional cost. Obviously, we, we wish we wish it well. We, we'd rather Fife still had that money, but we, we, we wish help to claim well. Does it change the structures that you've been raising concerns about here this morning in any way? Julie Malloy. Um, I think it, it is that gateway of a message, and there's a lot of fear about this system. Some people don't claim because the, the news stories, the, the image of it is very negative. Um, and I think actually the words help to claim are a very different message to some of the messages that have come out historically. So that, that is a part, an important step. It may alleviate, if it is a genuine, replay, a genuine um, addition, it may alleviate the pressure on the, the financial inclusion type services that we all offer in terms of immediate claims. However, it still doesn't deal with the, the, the issues we've talked about in terms of the whole system. And there's something here about the connection of the system. 
the initial claim is really important, but how different benefits connect with each other, how the responsibilities that are with other organisations connect with each other. You were talking earlier in the meeting about school meals. We've had discussions around DHP um, and um, the, particularly the bedroom tax. Um, and the connections there are all important. So yes, advice to claim is important, but structurally, fundamentally, there needs to be shifts in the system that help people through it. But it's good that the committee's finding out more about, about the initiative. Uh, Michelle Ballantyne, do you want to follow up on some of that? Yeah, on, on the other side of the fence, um, I, I've been to a lot of job centres across the country now and, and observed <coughs> what goes on at their front end and talked to, obviously, the, the teams behind them. Um, and I wondered what kind of relationship you have with um, the job centres, you know, with DW3 through the job centres and the support mechanisms in there, because they, pretty much all of them that I've been to now have a, have a myriad of support going <coughs> on within the centre. And they ha their view is that they try to actively encourage people to come in and sit down with them and have these conversations and get you know, budget management support, all this sort of thing. So I'm wondering whether, whether you're experiencing any of that, whether you have contact with them. What's the relationship like? Oh, I'll take Paul Doherty first, followed by Gail Ward. We have a strong local relationship with our local Job Centre Plus. They provide us a, a significant amount of support to customers who need to claim universal credit. What Jeremy was mentioning around the date of claim is... The, the difficulty with the customer they've got to get to claim and while they're waiting one, two, three, four, five days, they're not going to get any universal credit for those dates. It's going to start when they make their claim. There's no backdating provision to the same level as we would have done with housing benefit. We, we have an excellent working relationship, I think, because Highland was thrown in from day one. Um, you know, we had no choice but to, but to do that, and that's, that's continued, and that, that's been really, really good working practice. We meet every six to eight weeks and look at local initiatives that we, that we can put in place to help to support people. I think one of the big difficulties we have is the rural context, and it's not always easy for people to be able to get in to access those services, um, and th that's one of the difficulties that we've had. I do have quite large concerns about protected date of claims, which will be there um, under universal credit legislation, so that if people are struggling to get that face-to-face -face contact because of rurality, etc., they will genuinely miss out on benefit entitlement. And I think that is quite um, a difficult one. And we are putting in our own services to try and ensure that that, that doesn't happen. Billy, am I worried? What? I said earlier we had strong relationships at a local level. Um, there's engagement with the community planning process, there's working groups. We're able to feed issues and themes through and I think that is really helpful. Um, often those themes that we can't resolve with the service centres, we're working at a local level to try and resolve. So that is a really useful channel. It, it kind of, I think it comes back to, you know, for many years having housing benefit um, managed locally. Um, we've built up information sharing protocols, we've built up relationships, local knowledge, and um, I think that the, the job centre has the potential to, to kind of um, replace that in some ways, if, if that's the way things remain. Um, so, yep, yeah, it's great, it works well, the commitment's there. Um, we still have issues, but at least we have a, a local connection to be able to work with. We might have John Mills the final comment on this. Just I want to give members a time check and witnesses as well. We've got about 20 minutes left, and I've got Alice and Johnson and Keith Brown still so wanting to come in and raise some uh, lines of questioning. But John Mills, yeah, do you want to add something? Just to, to, to answer your question, a very positive relationships with local job centres. Uh, it's really the DWP at arm's length, which is the issue here. So I think we do joint training. We actually do joint visits, uh, indeed, in, in tenants' homes. So really positive, and staff are really motivated to do the best they can. So but there's, no, there's no criticism there at all. But it's actually dealing with contact centres at some length and the communication issues that arise. That's where the, the main difficulties are. Thank you. OK. Uh, Alison Johnson. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Um, and thank you. It's been an interesting session. Um, I'd kind of like to continue on that theme of the support that exists. Um, 
for tenants. I think very early on in this um, committee's work, it feels like a long time ago now, we took evidence, um, I think it was from East Lothian Council, with regards to implicit consent and the issues um, around that. And I see that the Fife Council in your written submission say that the DWP needs to reconsider the issue of consent and allow councils to have implied consent um, because obviously that would help council officers, you know, assist um, people more easily. So I'd just like to understand to what extent the arrangements for explicit and implicit consent are an issue when you're supporting tenants with their claims. Ms Mills. I, mean, I think that point's made uh, by the Head of Revenues and Commercial Services. Um, whenever we're made aware of someone, say, moving from housing benefit to universal credit, we will go and pay a visit, or at a tenancy start, we will actually go and pay a visit. So we've, we've just employed a, another uh, set of new revenues officer staff, and they're in post now so that they can actually go and get that explicit consent from the tenant at that point to then assist with the claim. Now, if the DWP accepted that we were um, a trusted landlord uh, in terms of a local authority, why wouldn't we actually get that implicit consent? Because the tenant uh, has signed a tenancy contract with the council. So I, I think it's just getting over that kind of issue around, uh, uh, you know, uh, being trusted that, that we've got the consent of the tenant because we're actually acting on their best behalf and we're trying to sustain their tenancy. So but I think that's the point that Les is making in the paper. So it actually in increases our resource uh, requirement uh, in terms of face-to-face -face contact with the tenant and that's something that we'd rather spend on, on other areas of support. And is that a view shared by others? I think implicit consent makes it so much easier to resolve issues in the customer's best interests. Explicit consent by definition means that you have to go to the customer, you have to actually make contact with the customer, with some customers with significant vulnerabilities that's very challenging and resource intensive. Um, then you, by the time you do get the customer, they have to say they want to, somebody to contact to deal with the issue. This is all time and delay and stress, and it just makes it very difficult in the environment to do best to support those customers. Various nodding heads there. I want to just get, get put on the record now. Yeah. yeah, I'd just like to understand why this change, you know, came about. Why did we move to explicit consent when it seems to be so resource intensive and unhelpful. I think it was around data protection because it was about getting the customer's consent to share that information with a third party. Universal credit and legacy benefits are customer money. You know, housing costs is customer money. It's ultimately to come to the landlord, but really it's the customer's responsibility to deal with it. It's just when you're dealing with a, a general population, then their consent is, is welcomed and ensuring that they are supported to manage their money in the best way possible. But when you have customers who are significantly vulnerable, then the worst thing that will happen is if they have to do all of these things and they don't do it, they will be evicted. They will not pay, the money will not come through, and the customer cannot then access the support that they need. What can we do about this? Gail Ward. I think the, the comments that um, John made about the trusted partner, that, that seems to be the trick that DWP are missing in relation to all of this is because if we are a trusted partner, then that definitely works both ways. And we're signing up to that commitment to say we are there to represent our most vulnerable clients. And therefore, if we've signed to that status, and if that means you know, signing a legally binding agreement to say that we will be that partner status, then that should get us over that barrier of this explicit con explicit consent. I think going historically going back, Jeremy and I had the very, very first meeting with DWP colleagues back in 2013, and they didn't even see a role for the landlord within the universal credit environment at all. Um, so I'm pleased to say that we've made leaps and bounds over that period of time, but although they've, they've taken that step forward to engage more with landlords, I just don't think they're bringing the the consent, the explicit, implicit consent along with that. And I think that's quite disappointing because ultimately with implicit consent, we could do a lot better and help resolve quite a lot of the issues that the universal credit system has. So it's clear you'd like to see some change here. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. And we look south, 
reiterate that um, if the landlord portal could be developed to actually have information that we can get anyway, you know, the, 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 that we can legitimately get, so we don't have to, um, landlords don't have to go pestering the DWP for it, it would uh, ease up a lot of log jams. Thank you. Okay, can, Thank can you. I just check for the purposes of, of, of the record? There was, again, the official report doesn't pick up on, on nodding heads, but for those two underlying uh, points, is there agreement amongst all five uh, witnesses in relation, in relation to that? Thank you. Uh, Alice, uh, sorry, Keith Brown. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for the evidence so far. Um, I suppose uh, the question I've got relates in particular to, I think, Julia and Paula really. Um, interested to hear Julia mention the bedroom tax earlier on. Believe it or not, there's been some discussion in this committee as to whether the bedroom tax exists or not, but um, leaving that to one side, I'm conscious that from what's been said, there are different things which apply in your areas um, to just across the border. And I think in both areas you don't have council housing stock, neither in Dumfries or Galloway borders. Just over the border, so it's just your awareness of any differences. Is the various things which are done in Scotland, so you could see the different tax rates which never apply on for impacts, uh, council tax reduction, bedroom tax mitigation, or the Scottish choices that were mentioned. What's been, the, as you can best tell, the, the impact, both in terms of homelessness arrears and so on but also in terms of the complexity of the system that you have to develop which must be more complex than it is on the other side of the border are you aware talking to colleagues in those councils across the border of what the impact of these differences are, is interesting question sharing from best practice given the close proximity who wants to take up the cudgels of that one Slightly reluctantly, I think Paula Doherty might be volunteering. Reluctantly. I think um, the Dumfries and Galloway Council just touches on the border. Um, so I'm going to nod to the other side to answer the rest of the question. Um, the, one of the major issues that we had is we don't have an awful lot of cross-border tra traffic. Although I do have a member of staff who moved to Carlisle and was told six months later that it was time she moved her GP because she was continuing to benefit from free prescriptions when she should no longer have been doing so. Um, she didn't get a lot of prescriptions, so don't panic about that one. Um, the, the job centre, from the position of Gretna, it's often easier for a customer to go to Carlisle to the job centre, whereas for Universal Credit and Scottish Choices, they have to come to Annan, so that they're no longer able to move around job centre, and that's an issue for, for Universal Credit customers generally. In Sanka, we had the same issue as the previously used to go to Cumnock. Now, because they were a Dumfries and Galloway resident, we went live at a different point. They had to go to Annan or Dumfries. So that hopefully, as we're now all full service, then customers will start to be allocated a job centre which is closest to them. But certainly that won't happen over the border. They won't, they won't ever go to Carlisle. Julia Malloy. Thank you. Um, the, um, I think we don't have direct co contact with the local authorities over the border because we are working in a different system. But we did, in the development of our preparations for implementation of welfare reform generally, and over the years have made sure we've attended um, events down south alongside in Scotland so we can keep up with the, um, the impact of rollout in different places. Um, something which we are in discussions with at the moment is a piece of research on the impact of arrears that's been undertaken with the DWP on um, with eight landlords south of the border and we're looking at um, participating in that at the moment which maybe will develop our understanding um, I think you know we we just looking at the housing sector generally down south it is very different some of the challenges are very different um, we've managed um, to significantly mitigate the impact of under-occupation um, uh, uh, um, in a way that um, by working with the local authority and through changes in funding that's been really beneficial. Um, I think for us it is about the joining up of all the um, rules around under-occupation, the localised benefits, and the, the UK-wide ones. I did mention earlier about the call centre, that, um, that some of the um, tenants living in the southern end of Berwickshire were dealing with Middlesbrough. Um, that 
has caused issues because understanding isn't there. So there's clearly differences in the system for people looking for um, the Scottish benefits that maybe aren't available south of the border. It's interesting, there is so little evidence of any comparative effect of different policies, whether for good or bad. I mean, if you're going to mitigate things, you'd like to know if it's having an effect, I suppose, and it's perhaps a little bit surprising there's not that kind of um, comparative evidence available. But on, on a different question, if I can, Convener, the various things which have been mentioned about different things which have had an impact, I think John Mills talked about um, a further million pound going to other services to try and help the situation. There was the proposed changes to the HRA account that you mentioned. There was a Dundee example of what they are doing. And the impact <coughs> on other services because of what might be termed either the shortcomings of universal credit or the problems associated with transitioning to universal credit. All this is, seems to be adding a lot of complexity and expense to the system. And on the other side, you've had the benefit cap, um, you've had sanctions, you've had um, a couple of other things, which I think Jeremy Hewer mentioned, which are pushing down or seeking to push down the cost of the taxpayer. And yet this is having another effect in terms of the costs which are being associated with trying to deal with the system. Um, and those are falling on different public bodies, whether the councils or Scottish governments. It would be interested in any comment to any of the panel members would have on that. I'll take Jeremy Hewer first, then I'll take John Mills. Um, thank you, Chair. I was just going to say, but um, on your original question, I, I do get the opportunity to um, swap notes with um, the other federations in, in England, Wales and Northern Ireland and, and, and to meet with um, social landlords from England. And I think they will be very envious. They are very envious of, of the provisions that we've got up here. It, it, it has been a very positive um, you know, Im impact that, that, that's been made. Um, sorry, your second question was about... Just about the costs of trying to deal with a change in the system and where they're falling. I think I would love to be able to quantify that because I think there have been inevitably increased costs for social landlords, either through the direct provision of, of more financial inclusion, um, welfare support services, but also things like, um, you know, increasing the provision for bad debt. And that's you know, that's a hit on the budget as well. Um, I think it was um, at a pre in another um, meeting the, of, of this committee when you've had um, Bill Scott from Inclusion Scotland on, he's, he coined the phrase, it isn't cost saving, it's cost shunting. Mm -hmm. And I think there is, there is a lot of that. And also the concern is, I think, from the National Audit Office report on universal credit that came out in June last year, you know, the unit costs for unit, uh, universal credit are still pretty horrendous. I mean, they're, they're nowhere near their, their target figure yet. And until they've actually got the systems again, to, to go on about this, um, to underpin the, the administration of universal credit, they are still going to be costly because not only is it costly to do the initial thing, but there's also costs about rectifying the errors the, the you know the incidents of errors that are coming up, mispostings, that, that money going to the wrong landlords, which you know hopefully will end, um, be, be cured when 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 they have the systems to prove that. But it'd be nice to see those systems in place. Yes, yeah, and I think we we can and we are collating evidence at the moment. I think Highland's done the same where we're actually looking at the additional costs uh, caused by this uh, implementation of universal credit and the push from centre to local administration costs. Now, I've only mentioned the HRA. I reckon it's 3.5 million additional costs since the implementation of universal credit. But there'll be other knock-on costs to not just council services, not just housing, but to the voluntary sector and, 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 and other um, uh, services because they are being more skewed towards helping people through through this system of universal credit implementation. Um, so we will be uh, writing to uh, the DWP uh, and say there's the bill for it. You know, I mean, we're quite clear that that ad additional cost should not be borne by council rent payers or council taxpayers, and and I think that's an important issue that uh, we would want the the committee to certainly be aware of. Um, I don't know in terms of homelessness if the committee are already aware and have looked at the homelessness monitor for uh, Scotland and just published a few weeks ago. And it's, there's a lot in here in welfare reform impacts on 
vulnerable households and the additional costs that are having to be put in by local authorities and partners to try and sustain those households in whatever accommodation they're in to try and transition them in to more settled uh, accommodation. So, you know, there are a number of impacts, direct costs to tenants and council taxpayers, but also uh, um, costs that we've not yet uh, evidenced to support vulnerable households to prevent them becoming homeless. So that, that, that has to be looked at in the whole uh, and, and, and the kind of, uh, not just the human costs, but the financial costs uh, arising from that as well. And just last little point sure. to say that that's increasing costs and interestingly about unit costs um, and that increasing complexity seems to be two things which were at odds with what universal credit was meant to achieve. I don't think it's that controversial to say, but our form of position is five is you take housing costs out of universal credit. Um, and, and that is an actual position as well in terms of heads of housing. So, you know, I think, is it about trying to improve a system which is really difficult to improve and, and is not simple, it is complex, or you just revert to housing benefit support? And I think that's something that's locally administered, uh, although it's not devolved as yet to Scotland, uh, and that's another argument. But certainly it's locally administered and we can sort out a lot of the issues locally uh, through good joint working between um, um, housing associations, councils and, and local job plus centres. Now, I apologise because of time constraints, but you have now put on the record what was in the written submission in relation to housing costs when taking cost out of universal credit. Time constraints means we can't really have a discussion around that, but you've made your position um, clear here this morning. We should just gauge whether or not other witnesses agree with that or otherwise. And I'm sorry, we can't really let you expand on your points because of time constraints, but I'm just wondering, would others agree that uh, housing costs should be taken out of that and already put a right, submission okay. in forward. I guess just for the record that all, all five witnesses would, would support that. There are a couple of things we didn't get around to this morning that um, we should really at least mention and if, if, if there can be a brief response or even just come back to us in, in, in relation to it, the, the, the on costs elsewhere was mentioned by, by Mr Mills. One of the things we've explored in other witness sessions has been uh, concerns around the cost of, say, temporary furnished accommodation uh, for, for, for those escaping homelessness and look for pathways of homelessness into permanent accommodation. There has been some concern about the, the costs, particularly for the, 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 the in-work homeless people who are almost being priced out of the cost of temporary furnished flats, which, which would appear punitive and the committee can't quite understand why they are so significantly expensive and also when you add on the cost of having your furniture put in storage as well. I, I'm aware of in my constituent case of families who will simply be seriously overcrowded sofa surfing with other family members rather than take up a temporary furnished solution. So any observations you would have in that, even if I can't give you the opportunity just now to respond to that, but, but that, these are costs when the issue that are all picked up somewhere by a social security system, be it local authorities, be it a Scottish government, be it UK government. So just better ways of doing this. There's a lot of money in that system that I don't think we're particularly always using effectively. So any observation you give our committee back on that would be very helpful. And also, um, Edinburgh was in, and Edinburgh gave us some comments in relation to what they thought the use of discretionary housing payments um, and making year-long year awards in some cases because they felt that the sufficiency of funds, the committee probably feels it, it's at various right across the, across the country. It really depends where you are in the country, perhaps, the sufficiency of funds. So any, uh, a brief amount of time, just to like to put on the record just now, what, what you think of the funding situation is in relation to DHPs. I think that we would find that quite quite helpful. Um, should we just go from even le left to right? If You don't have to make a comment on it, but I think the committee would find it helpful. Gail Ward. Are you, want, are you wanting temporary accommodation on DHPs? <laughs> no, no I, think, I think if you've got anything on temporary accommodation, could you maybe send just, that to just, the committee? I think it's important for a consistency of questions that we ask at each evidence session that, that we put that on the record here this morning. So in relation to DHPs, I think would be helpful. Um, I, I think there has, there has to be probably an increase in the DHP funding to mitigate some of the um, issues that are Take it, Taking the bedroom tax aside, we're having to look at everything on a case-by-case -case basis and probably seeing some things around temporary accommodation maybe not being awarded um, when they possibly should be because we're too busy mitigating other, other welfare reform changes. Thank you. I don't expect you to expand any further. It's, we have to get a balance of evidence and what a local authority was suggesting was a sufficiency of funds and 
it'll, it'll vary across the country. John Mills, do you want to? Absolutely no uh, uh, flexibility in our application of DHP. It's mainly to mitigate bedroom tax. Okay, thank you. Julie Malloy. I'd rather Julie, come sorry. back on that one. Thanks. Okay, Jeremy here. I just think uh, DHPs have done a wonderful job in mitigating the bedroom tax with housing benefit, um, but probably at the expense of being a, a kind of cuckoo in the nest and um, shoving to one side all the other needs for for, um, for DHPs. And the sooner that um, bedroom tax can be mitigated at source, which is what we're Scottish Government's hoping the DWP can do, the better. Thank you. And Paula Dorsey? Um, my manager also manages homelessness within Dumfries and Galloway as a stock transfer landlord and we utilise the DHP regulations to support customers in a wider sense to prevent homelessness. I think that's quite a local, a local position and it's funded generally by the local authority. Um, there is cost to that obviously because the, the money that's paid in discretionary housing payments is a cost and it's hopefully to be a spend to save because we would hope that then these people don't end up in temporary accommodation which is a cost to the local authority. I think um, the amount of money we've got you know, can be sufficient but obviously the local authority is in a cash strap situation so more is always helpful but I think the wider use of discretionary housing payment has an administrative cost because the cost of administering a DHP for a universal credit customer is significantly higher than housing benefit customer. Okay thank you I know those were two quite substantive issues thrown at you in the, the dying seconds of an evidence session but just wanted to put some of it on the record and uh, we are about to move into private session in a second can I first of all thank all of you for your contribution here this morning uh, please do keep in contact with the committee with any additional thoughts or any additional evidence you want to give us uh, please feel free to do that and of course uh, stay up to date with the committee inquiry and um, we'll keep that relationship going so thank you very much that ends agenda item three we now move to agenda item four uh, which will be in private so we move into private session thanks everyone